This lecture is a very brief introduction to visual attention and a little more detail on visual salience. Attentional selection is the second of the three visual stages, encoding, selection, and decoding. Encoding is to sample visual inputs and then represent the inputs in neural responses. Selection is to select a very small fraction of the inputs for further processing. And this is called attentional selection. This stage can also be called locking in layman's term. Decoding is then the seeing after looking to infer or recognize the visual seeing properties, such as to recognize a face from the selected inputs. Therefore, attentional selection is very important since it gates our visual perception. The reason we need selection is because there's information bottlenecks in the visual pathway. Visual input data is about 25 megabytes per second, coming from about 25 images per second, received by millions of photoreceptors on our retina. This amount of data can contain the text in dozens of books. Retina can compress this data to about the amount for one book. This is still too much for us to read in one second. How much can we read in a second? Our attention can read about two sentences per second, or this equivalent amount of visual information. This means more than 99% of the information is ignored or deleted. Only a tiny fraction is selected by our attention, so we are blind to the non-selected part. This does not seem to agree with our impression since we feel that we can see everything in front of us clearly. This is because we do not know what we do not see. Here is a demonstration of our blindness. Can you see the difference between these two images? The difference is quite big. If you're not blind, you should see it immediately. Most people cannot see it immediately or within 10 seconds. Here it is, right here. This portion is very different from that portion. Therefore, we are blind to almost everything in front of us except the tiny bit that we pay attention to. And we have this flow diagram of visual information. These are the questions we can ask to study attention, how to direct attention, and what are the consequences. Each question has its behavior and neural aspects, and we start with how attention is directed behaviorally. In terms of eye movements, attention can be directed overtly by moving our gaze to where we select visual inputs, or covertly, by selecting from the corner of our eyes. For example, in this image, overt selection may start by gaze position here on this person, and then maybe moving to that person, maybe then here, maybe moving to the chair, maybe then to the door, or back to this person, etc. Here is the trajectory of one person's gaze movement, and here is another trajectory and a third one. Alternatively, let's try covert selection. Fix your gaze at this cross and try to see the letters to the right. Can you see the letters clearly? Especially the middle letter. You are now paying attention to the letters covertly. Now move your gaze to the letters 
Now you are selecting overtly and you can see the letters clearly. The middle letter is T. This demonstrates that overt selection is much more effective. And that's why in natural behavior, gaze always follows where our attention is directed. In terms of the factors driving the selection, we have top-down and bottom-up factors. Top-down factor is also called task-driven, goal-directed, voluntary, non-reflexive, and endogenous. For example, your gaze may be not directed to these words because you have a goal. This goal is to listen to this lecture. Bottom-up selection is also called stimulus-driven, goal-independent, involuntary, reflexive, and exogenous. For example, even though your goal is to listen to this lecture, your gaze can be automatically captured by your dog if your dog suddenly jumps at you from your side. Your dog is the external stimulus that attracts your attention in the bottom-up manner. Here is a study that compares the properties of top-down and bottom-up selections. Each trial show you this fixation image first. It has four boxes and one central dot. Your gaze has to be fixed to the central dot. Later in time, so time goes this way, an item appears in each of the four boxes. All of these items are across except for one box which contains a letter T. And your task is to report this whether this letter T is the right way up or upside down. In this example, it is the right way up. This task is not easy because the items in the boxes are shown for only a very brief duration and then disappear. And also because you do not know ahead of time which box may contain this letter T. If you do know ahead of time which box may contain this letter T, your attention can be more prepared to shift that, shift to that rotate location. So we can give this information through this Q stimulus by flashing this box, there's a flash, just before the test stimulus appears. This flash attracts your attention to this box. As your gaze is still fixed to the central point, your attention is shifted covertly to the flashed box. So now you can see the letter T more clearly. If the letter T does not appear in the flashed box, but in another box, then you cannot see the letter T as clearly since your attention has been misled. When the flash or the cue is at the same location as the target letter T, we call the trial a validly cued trial. Otherwise, it is an invalidly cued trial. We can also cue in an alternative way. Instead of a flash at a box, we can use an arrow at the fixation point, pointing to that box. This cueing by a flash is called bottom-up or exogenous cueing. It gives information directly at a candidate target location. This cueing by an arrow is called top-down or endogenous cueing. It gives information indirectly, not at a candidate target location. Both types of cueing can be valid or invalid. So with a study like this, we can compare the properties of bottom-up and top-down guidance of attention by the corresponding queuing methods. So we can find that bottom-up queuing is faster acting, even though its effect does not last as long. And it is stronger, 
and harder to ignore. This may explain why our attention can be so easily distracted by irrelevant visual inputs. For example, if your task is to find a non-horizontal bar in this input, top-down attention be should be directed to this target bar, but you cannot help noticing this non-target red bar because its unique color attracts your attention in a bottom-up manner, independent of your goal. This distraction can slow you down in reporting your target bar. This is an example when bottom-up attentional guidance interferes with your task. Bottom-up guidance of attention can also help in a task. In this study, your task is to report the identity of the target bar in this red box and ignore all the other bars which are non-target bars. You report whether the target bar is white vertical, black horizontal, or otherwise like the non-target bars. The task is not easy, firstly because all the bars appear for only a very brief duration and then disappear. Secondly, because you have to keep your gaze fixated on the central cross, which is always there in the image. However, the location of this red cross is known to you ahead of time. It's always at the same location in all trials. This knowledge is a top-down factor to guide your attention ahead of time. There are two ways to do this experiment. In the first way, the red box is always present on the display screen throughout the whole experimental session. So you not only know its location ahead of time, this location is marked out for you constantly. In the second way, this red box is flashed on 50 to 150 millisecond before all the bars appear. This sudden onset of the red box attracts your attention in a bottom-up manner so that task becomes easier in the second way of doing experiment compared to the first way of doing experiment. Even though your attention is already guided by the top-down factor, the bottom-up factor still helps on top of it. So in this case, the bottom-up guidance helps you do a task. We can also distinguish whether attention is space-based, object-based, or feature-based. In space-based attention, attention is directed to a coordinated location on the image, for example, directed to this particular location. In object-based attention, all locations in the same object can benefit from directing attention to any location on this object. For example, if you direct your attention to this cross, attention can spread within this rectangle so that this location can benefit better than this location. So if you do a task at this location, you do better than if you do it at this location, even though they are equal distant from this cross. Similarly, if you direct attention to this cross, then this location benefit more than that location. In feature-based attention, your attention can be guided by a top-down feature. For example, if you are looking for a red cup, you are selecting by the red feature. So all red colored inputs are preferentially processed. Bottom-up guidance operates only through space-based attention. We have just seen how to direct attention in terms of psychological behavior. Now let's see in terms of physiological neurons. We can ask for instance, which brain areas are involved in guiding attention? 
here is the folded monkey's brain uh, looking from the side this is the eyeball this is the frontal part of the brain this is the back part of the brain if you unfold this cortical sheet this becomes the unfolded brain so these are the two retinas and then the information go to v1 which is the primary visual cortex then continue on to v2 v3 etc until all the way to the frontal part this part fef stands for frontal eye field and this part sc stands for superior colliculus and it's involved in guiding eye movements so we can look at uh, which brain areas send input to the superior colliculus um, they might be involved in guiding attention so for instance we notice v1 sends input directly to superior colliculus and so does the retina Here is a circuit diagram for connections between brain regions for controlling eye movements. This is the superior colliculus receiving inputs from V1 and from the retina. It sends output through brain regions to the eye muscles to control eye movements. Frontal eye field and the parietal regions, they also send inputs to superior colliculus into its deeper layers. The frontal eye field can also bypass superior colliculus, directly control the region controlling eye movements. Inputs also come from the extra stride areas into superior colliculus. So these are the areas beyond V1 along the visual pathway. So they are V2, V3, V4, etc. However, in monkeys, V1 is the major source of inputs to the superficial layers of the superior colliculus. We also notice that V1 is massive in its size, much larger than the frontal eye field. So it's likely to play a role in guiding attention. If a V1 neuron is stimulated, an eye movement can be evoked to the receptive field location of this neuron. This is presumably by this route of action. Meanwhile, frontal eye field and superior colliculus by itself also affects attention. For example, if their neurons are stimulated, visual task performance is improved at the corresponding visual field locations, which are the movement fields of these stimulated neurons. This is so even if these neural stimulations are not strong enough to evoke eye movements. This is as if attention is shifted covertly to the corresponding visual location to improve task performance. We have briefly looked at the question of how to direct attention, both behaviorally and neurally. Now, let us look at the question of what are the consequences of directing attention. First, we look at the behavioral level. Since attentional selection is before the visual decoding or seeing stage in this framework of vision as these three stages, by definition, attentional selection makes visual decoding better that means makes visual performance better. And better visual performance means faster and more accurate performance. This can be measured by the cueing effect, by how much an appropriate attentional guidance shortens reaction times and increases accuracy of a task performance. For example, in this study, if 80% of the 
of the validly queued trials are performed correctly, but only 70% of the invalidly queued trials are performed correctly, then the difference between them, 10%, can be a measure of the queuing effect. The queuing effect can also be measured by the reaction times. Let's say if these kind of trials take only half a second of reaction time, but these kind of trials take only 0.7 second of the reaction time, then the difference between them, 0.2 second, is another measure of the queuing effect. The magnitude of the queuing effect of course depends on the queuing method whether it is exogenous queuing or an endogenous queuing and also depends on other details of the queuing now let's look at the effects of attention on neural activities these effects are mostly studied under top-down attention and they are observed in neural activities in uh, extra strike cortices like V2, V4, IT, and MT. These effects in V1 are relatively weaker or non-existent. The experimental design is often like this. Here's the display screen and the monkey fixates on the central cross. And this dashed box marks the rest of the field of a neuron being recorded. Of course, this box is only for illustration here, not shown. To the monkey. It contains two visual items, in this example two bars. Often one of them has a visual feature, let's say the orientation of the bar, that is preferred by the neuron, and another one has a non-preferred feature. They can also put visual input outside the rest of the field. And the monkeys are trained to covertly pay attention to one visual item, let's say this one for example, and it may be trained to detect any color change in this bar while keeping uh, the gaze fixed here. So presumably its attention is covertly directed to this bar. So the neural activities are then measured while the monkey does the task. So we can see how these activities depend on which visual input and which feature that the monkey is paying attention to. This way, it has been found that if there are two items in the rest of the field, and if attention is directed outside the rest of the field, let's say monkey is doing a task on this bar, then the neural response to these two items is as if the average of the response to each of the items alone. However, if attention is directed to one of the two items, let's say directed to this one inside the rest of the field, then the response is as if the other item is absent. Uh, we note that here, these neural response changes um, are not caused by any change in the retina input because in all situations, the monkey has to keep gaze fixed onto the central cross. So the response changes are by changes in where and to which visual feature the attention is directed to covertly. We can also have a design in which only one item is within the rest of the field. And then we examine how neural responses depend on which item the monkey is paying attention to. In more detail, let's say this is the response curve of one neuron. Its response increases with the input strength within its residue field. If attention is directed towards this residue field, you can see typically an increase in the response so that the blue curve becomes the red curve. This means attention increases the sensitivity of this neuron. Attention can also change input response in other ways. This is, is as if here, attention increases the effective input strength. You can also measure the feature tuning curve of the neuron. For example, let's say 
This is the orientation tuning curve of a neuron. The feature value is then the orientation theta of a bar within its recessive field. Attention to the recessive field can change this tuning curve. For example, to scale it up or to change its shape so that the feature tuning width is made smaller or bigger depending on the attentional state. These kind of phenomena are called biased competition, meaning that visual inputs compete for being represented in the brain and top-down attention to an input item or input feature biases the competition so that more brain resources are used to represent the attended input. So far, only one study showed how bottom-up attention affects neural responses. The study's design is like this. Here is the fixation stimulus. The monkey fixates on a central point, and this is the feel of the neuron being studied. Then an exogenous cue flashed. After a pause, the probes appear. One inside the rest of the field. So we can measure the neuron's response to the probe, how it depends on the exogenous cue, whether it is on the rest of the field or away from the rest of the field. This is how the V1 neurons respond. At time zero is when the probes appear and then the response starts to rise, peaks, and then drops. There are two response curves. One is the black one. The black one here is for when the cue is on the rest of the field. Okay, and the other one is the lighter gray one. It's for when the cue is away from the rest of the field. You can see these two curves differ a lot here. So this is the difference between the two response levels, uh, different response conditions, starting at around 90 uh, milliseconds after the uh, probe onset. This means an exogenous flash on the rest of the field causes uh, enhanced sensitivity of the neuron in this time window. However, at the same time, we notice that the, the neuron also responds to the cue here when the cue is inside the rest of the field. And uh, of course, when the cue is away, it doesn't evoke any response. So here is the response to the cue. Now, just because this neuron also responds to the cue, it becomes problematic because one wonders whether the enhanced response in this time window is caused by a continued response to the cue superposed on the response to the probe. This seems unlikely because the response to the cue has already decayed to zero to the level where the, the cue is away. Um, and also the peak response uh, does not seem to depend on the cue and the cue of course already disappeared before the probe onset. However, this is not proof because the cue is part of the input. Uh, you can never know whether it might uh, induce further response um, in this time window. Therefore, we have a confirm here whether the enhanced response really is uh, due to the a continuous response to the cue because the cue is actually part of the input, even though it already disappeared by the time the probe onset. One way to resolve this confound is to flash two cues, one on the rest of the field and one away from the rest of the field. In this double cue case, the neural response after the probe onset is like that in the cue away condition. Okay, in this time window, um, there is limited or no response, uh, uh, no, no enhancement uh, in the response by this double Q case. So therefore, just having a Q on the rest of the field is not sufficient to cause such an enhancement that is observed when there's a Q as only single one Q on the rest of the field as no other Q in the display. So the enhancement is uh, 
cost, the enhancement requires that there is no second queue on the display to compete for attention attracted to the rest of the field. So far, all the neural and behavioral phenomena we talked about are correlates of each other. We do not know in concrete terms which neural circuits and by which mechanism lead to which behavior. One exception is the neural mechanisms to guide attention exogenously. Hence, let's focus on the bottom-up attentional guidance and omit the top-down aspects. To proceed, we define saliency as the degree of a spatial location to attract attention in the bottom-up manner. Salience can be measured by the reaction times in visual search tasks. For example, in this image, the saliency at the location of the unique vertical bar can be measured by the shortness of the reaction time or the search time needed to find the vertical bar. So it is quicker to find it in this image than it is to find the vertical bar in this image and it takes even longer to find in this image. So therefore we say the location of the vertical bar has a high salience here, a less a smaller salience here and even smaller salience there. In this image, the location of the red bar is also very high, having a high salience. However, in this image, it takes a long time to find the red vertical bar. And this bar is defined by the unique conjunction of the red color and vertical orientation. So therefore we say the salience at this location is very low. In these bottom two images, we notice that the unique cross among bars in this case is much more salient than the unique bar among crosses. In some visual searches, such as these two, The reaction time does not increase with the number of noun targets in visual search. These searches are called efficient search. In other searches, such as, such as this one, to find the unique red vertical bar, the reaction time increases with the number of noun targets. It's an inefficient search. This is mainly because attention has to vi visit uh, the search items one by one to see whether it's a target because the actual target is so non-salient that uh, it doesn't attract attention automatically. If the search target is unique in some basic feature dimensions like orientation in this case and color in that case or motion direction which is not shown here then it gives an efficient search. In the visual search literature an efficient search for a feature singleton defines the feature dimension as a basic feature dimension. One may ask the question, how can you measure saliency in behavior when behavior is the net result of both bottom-up and top-down guidance of attention? Well, the answer is you can fix the top-down factor and then measure the variations in behavior as reflecting the variations in the bottom-up salience. So for instance here, if you search for a vertical bar, so you have a top-down factor to guide you to the vertical feature, and this top-down factor is the same in these three cases. So therefore, the variations in reaction time in these three searches reflect the difference in the bottom-up factor, which is the salience. You can also find cases when the top-down and bottom-up factors go against each other. In such a case, for instance, when you are searching for a non-horizontal bar when you are distracted by the bottom-up attraction, then you can measure salience by the degree of its distraction to an ongoing task. In behavior, a map of saliency values across space is called a saliency map. 
it can guide bottom-up selection to the most salient location. In traditional wisdom, the saliency map is presumed to be residing in higher brain areas like the frontal eye field or the parietal areas. This is motivated by the observations that saliency is a general purpose measure. A location can be salient by any feature value in any feature dimension, given the right context. So the same saliency value may be caused by a unique red bar or a unique vertical bar or a unique moving bar. Therefore, it was presumed that neurons signaling saliency should not be tuned to specific feature values, so they could not be in a lower visual area where neurons are feature tuned. The traditional ideas give rise to this model of how a saliency map could be built. Visual input features in different feature dimensions are separately processed in parallel feature maps. These feature maps are then combined into a master map of saliency, in which the saliency value will be regardless of the input feature. The feature maps may correspond to lower visual areas, while the master map may correspond to higher cortical areas, such as the frontal and parietal parts. The basic feature dimensions to build the separate feature maps include color, orientation, motion direction, depth, scales, etc. The traditional ideas can naturally explain some saliency behavior. For example, if we have a visual input with a red vertical bar among blue vertical bars, the input is processed in a red feature map blue feature map, and vertical feature map. The response is higher when there's fewer activations in any feature map by design or definition, so that when these maps are combined, one gets a higher response at the most salient red bar location. In the second example, this image contains a unique red vertical bar among red horizontal bars and blue vertical bars. The unique red vertical bar is not salient since in the four feature maps activated, the red map, blue map, vertical map, and horizontal map, each input bar activates two feature maps. And the unique conjunction does not evoke higher responses, whether it's in the separate feature maps or in the master map, and therefore this unique conjunction is not salient. But how about V1? We already know that V1 provides the major source of input to the superior colliculus into its superficial layers. And uh, if you look at the visual pathway, going along the visual pathway, why do you have to do selection in later part of the visual pathway when you can do it earlier in V1? It seems to be waste to wait until later. More importantly, the traditional ideas of having separate feature maps before making a master saliency map lead to some predictions that do not agree with data. So let's examine the hypothesis that the saliency map is in V1. In particular, this map is proposed to be equal to the map of highest V1 responses to individual locations. So for example, this vertical bar in the visual input could evoke, let's say, 10 spikes per second in one of the V1 neurons. And this horizontal bar evokes only three spikes per second. These are the responses. They are all the highest responses to various visual locations. Then in this map, which is proposed to be the same, is uh, as the saliency map, 
the location for this highest response is the most salient. This map is then read out, perhaps by the superior calculus, to select the most salient location to guiding attention. So for simplicity, we omit top-down factors here. More precisely, let Rx be the highest response in V1 to visual location X, and let Bx as the bid for visual selection at visual location X. This is a physiological quantity, but this is a behavioral quantity. And the proposal is that they are equal to each other. This means neural activities are universal currency to bid for visual selection. And the recitative field of the most active V1 cell is selected. Therefore, the same saliency map or the same map of the highest V1 responses to various locations can arise from different inputs. For example, here, these three inputs could give rise to the same saliency map. And the saliency value represented by this specific firing rate could be caused by this vertical bar, or this red bar, or this moving bar. Of course, these uh, three different V1 neurons respond to these three different bars. One prefers vertical orientation in this case, and one prefers the red color, and one prefers this motion. But these different neurons share the same recitative field location, and they could give the same firing rate. And in this case, um, only their firing rates matter for the saliency map. This cartoon uses the auction shop metaphor to illustrate the situation. This auction shop has this slogan. Attention auction here. No discrimination between your feature preferences. Only spikes count. The auctioneer is perhaps the superior calculus. It does not need to recognize features, but can count the firing rates or the bids for attention. So here are the three bidders which are three V1 neurons. This neuron bids one spike and it prefers rightward motion. And this neuron bids three spikes and it prefers red color. This neuron bids two spikes and prefers this particular orientation. And obviously this neuron has the highest bid. So its recitative field should win the attentional spotlight. The neural circuit mechanisms within V1 can transform the retina input to the V1 firing rate map to highlight the salient locations. This image is made by optical imaging of a small region of V1 surface. And V1 is retina topic. Neurons having similar recitative field locations and preferring similar orientations cluster together. This surface is colored to visualize the preferred orientation of the underlying neurons. So for example, this region is colored blue to indicate that the underlying neurons prefer the uh, vertical orientation, and this region is colored red to indicate that the underlying neurons prefer horizontal orientation. Superposed on this colored V1 surface is an image of V1 neuron drawn in black ink. Its cell body is here, centered in this blue patch, so this neuron prefers vertical orientation. It sends axon branches to other cortical locations, so for instance here, here, these axon branches, and they are mostly in nearby blue patches. That means it's interacting with neurons nearby V1 neurons also tuned to vertical. A dominant interaction in V1 is the like-to-like -like suppression between V1 neurons so that V1 neurons tuned to the same or similar orientation suppress each other when they are nearby to each other. 
And therefore, these horizontal input bars, they evoke V1 responses in uh, V1 neurons tuned to horizontal. And these neurons suppress each other because they are all tuned to horizontal. So for instance, this horizontal bar evokes this response and this horizontal bar evokes this response. These are mutually suppressed responses. And in contrast, this unique vertical bar it evokes response from a V1 neuron tuned to vertical and therefore uh, it escapes the like-to-like -like suppression from the V1 neurons preferring and responding to the horizontal bars and therefore its response is higher, not suppressed. If we keep the vertical bar the same, so this vertical bar is the same as this vertical bar, but turn the horizontal bars into vertical. Now the neuron responding to the central vertical bar suffers from the like-to-like -like suppression. So now all the responses are suppressed and the central vertical bar is no longer salient. If the surrounding bars are removed, there's no suppression and a central bar is by default the most salient. These like-to-like -like suppressions have been observed for decades and we call them isofeature suppression. When the feature is orientation, it is iso-orientation suppression. Such interaction between neurons makes a V1 neuron's response depend on contextual inputs outside its recitative field. So all these horizontal bars surrounding the central, vertical, the central vertical bar and all these surrounding vertical bars, they are all outside the recitative fields. This contextual input dependency of V1 response is a nuisance to the concept of classical recitative field. But for the V1 saliency map, it is just what is needed for the computation. With color feature, iso feature suppression becomes iso color suppression. And similarly, we have iso motion direction suppression. All these interactions have been observed in V1. Then, a color singleton and a motion singleton can also be salient for the same reason. A model can be made of the V1 mechanisms for saliency. Each node here models a neuron, so if it has a plus sign in it, it means an excitatory neuron, principal neuron, so these are modeling the parameter cells. And this node with a minus sign in it, it models the inhibitory interneuron. So these two parameter cells are mutually exciting each other through these horizontal connections between them. This principal neuron is exciting this inhibitory interneuron, which then inhibit this one. So Therefore, this principal neuron is disynectically inhibiting this principal neuron and vice versa. So there is mutual inhibition between them. These neural connections are designed to implement the known, physiologically known V1 interactions, in particular iso-orientation suppression, as well as some other more subtle type of interactions. And the visual inputs coming into the principal neurons, for example, let's say this neuron has a recitative field here, and maybe if it's preferring horizontal orientation, then this bar will give direct input to this neuron through its classical recitative field. And maybe then the second neuron may be receiving input from another bar, for example. So therefore, given this input, through these model interactions, then the output eventually coming from the principal neurons gives the pattern of model response. And in this pattern of responses, you can see uh, we use different thicknesses of bars to visualize the response levels. And this is also the case in the input. 
where all the bars are marked the same thickness to mean that in this example, all the input bars have the same input contrast. But with this interaction, we notice that this unique vertical bar evokes higher response than all the horizontal bars because we have this iso orientation suppression within the model. For simplicity, this model omits the color feature and motion direction feature to illustrate how it works. Here is another example of an input pattern made of two neighboring textures, and this is the response. We notice that the highest response are at the bars near the texture border. This is because a bar, a bar at the texture border has fewer iso orientation neighbors compared to a bar within the texture. Therefore, it suffers from weaker iso orientation suppression. That makes the texture border very salient. That helps the texture segmentation. Also, because we have, in addition, in V1, not only iso-orientation suppression, but also collinear facilitation, so that means the interaction is not isotropic with respect to orientation. That makes these border bars evoke higher response compared to these border bars. So the border bars parallel to the texture border evokes higher response compared to border bars perpendicular to the texture border. Here is another example of an input pattern and its response. Even though these are more complex textures, you can see the highest response is still to the texture border bars. That really helps the texture segmentation. Here is a more complex input pattern, which has a circle and a long bar embedded in a noise. And we can see in model response, the circle, the smooth circle and the smooth long um, bar evokes higher responses. They are more salient, uh, kind of emerges from the background. This is so even though in V1, there isn't a single neuron that is specifically looking for such a huge circle because each neuron's residue is very small, only for one individual bar. And all these interactions between neighboring V1 neurons can cause this emergent behavior of a whole circle coming out. That means we do not need to wait until higher visual areas with larger residual field to have such saliency behavior to these global patterns. Here is another example. This is an input of a cross within bars and here is an input of a bar within cross and we already noticed that this cross within bar is much more salient than the bar within crosses and uh, these are the responses you can see indeed the most salient response is at this location and here the most salient response is not at this bar, unique bar. Okay, so this bar is not salient. So they agree with behavior. Now let's notice the reason this uh, cross is salient and not, not because the response to the vertical bar is salient, just because it's actually because the response to the horizontal bar is salient. This horizontal bar in the cross escapes iso orientation suppression. So therefore it evokes the highest response. In contrast, this vertical bar in this bar among crosses, this vertical bar is experiencing iso orientation suppression from the neighboring vertical bars in the neighboring crosses. So therefore, its response is very low, so it's not salient. Now let's notice that all these uh, phenomena come out not because there's any neuron in the model responding to a cross. Uh, all we need is a mechanism for neurons, some neurons responding to the horizontal bars, some neurons responding to the vertical bars. We do not need a cross detector to make these phenomena happen. And uh, therefore, it means we do not need to wait until 
higher visual areas where you have like cross detectors for such saliency behavior for complex patterns like crosses or big uh, um, global circles uh, to, to emerge. So, so far we showed that V1 mechanisms can account for the known phenomena of saliency. Now we show that the V1 saliency hypothesis also predicts something unknown and unexpected. We know before that unique feature singletons in color, orientation, or motion are salient. Now, what if we predict that in this image, this bar is salient and that it should attract attention? It will be very surprising this, because this bar doesn't look any different from other bars. This is what the theory predicts if this image is made from superposing these two images, one shown to the left eye and one shown to the right eye. We can show different images to different eyes by using stereo goggles that's used for watching 3D movies. This bar is unique because it comes uniquely from the right eye. However, in perception, we perceive this image and we cannot tell that this bar is unique. And this uniqueness is um, not visible to us. In fact, unless we close one eye at a time, we do not know that each bar is only visible to one eye only. However, eyes of feature suppression also applies to this feature, the eye of origin of visual input. So this bar does not suffer from eyes of eye of origin suppression. It should therefore evoke higher responses so should be salient and attract attention if the V1 theory is correct. This prediction is a hallmark of V1 because V1 has monocular neurons. Some prefer left eye input, some prefer right eye input. So we can have neurons preferring the same eye suppress each other. However, V2 and above do not have monocular neurons. So information about eye of origin is lost starting from V2. So any saliency that could be associated with this unique eye of origin bar cannot arise beyond V1 in the cortex. This prediction is confirmed experimentally. In this experiment, we show this image to the left eye and this image to the right eye and the perceived image is like the superposition of them. So the, here is a unique eye of origin singleton. It is not distinctive to perception, but predicted to be salient. And this is an orientation singleton. It's the target in a visual search task. It is salient, it's known to be salient and it's perceptually distinctive. And observers are instructed to search for this unique orientation singleton as soon as possible and ignore all distractions. However, in most trials, they just cannot help to have their first gaze shift towards this non-distinct, non-target. So it is the bottom-up attraction of this unique eye of origin singleton it interferes with their search task because it distracts their attention. Even though observers do not know its distinctiveness or know its existence, and many observers are not even aware of the fact that their first gaze shift um, is uh, towards this non-target. This is as if this unique eye of origin bar is having a unique color to them even though, of course, perceptually, they cannot sense this unique eye of origin, this unique color, as if it's a unique color, but their attentional system seems to be able to sense this and being automatically attracted to it. And so this confirms the theoretical prediction. This bar is salient, this bar is salient, and apparently, this one is even more salient to interfere with the task.
This is a very brief introduction to visual attention and visual saliency and hope that it's useful.